Welcome. My name is Peter Toy, and I'm one of the English pastors at Brow Trail Baptist Church. Thank you for deciding to join with us as we look into God's Word today. We'll be continuing on in our series in the book of Acts, and today we'll be looking at Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 12. The title of this message is, The Spirit Will Build Christ's Church. But before we look into God's Word, let's look to the Lord together. Let's pray. Father, we've come to you to hear from you. I pray, Lord, that you would quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and fix our eyes on Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, have mercy on your children and speak to us this day. And then let your word dwell richly in our hearts until it changes us, until we bear fruit to become like Jesus Christ and to draw others to him. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What's God doing in the church today? I was talking with another um, young pastor and he was asking, what's going to happen with the church? Now with the pandemic, will people come back? Our church is still closed, but last week I went to another church in my neighborhood that was open, just to kind of check it out, to see how it was doing. And it was, it was a good service. But do you know how many people were in that service? The church on a typical Sunday morning probably would ha have about 400 to 500 people in it. That morning in the auditorium, there were about 50 of us. What is God doing in the church? I don't know. Will people come back to the church if and when we open up after the pandemic? I don't know. But I do know this. God is in control and He is the Lord of the church. And He will fulfill His perfect plan. That's what we'll be looking at this morning in this passage in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13 starts a new section in the book of Acts. There's actually four sections of the book of Acts. The first section is from Acts chapter 1 to 7. And it talks about the birth of the church and the growth of the church in Jerusalem. And then the second section is from Acts 8 to 12. This section talks about the spread of the church outside of Jerusalem to Samaria. And eventually the gospel going to the Gentiles. And now we're beginning the third section of the book, which talks about the church spreading out throughout the Roman world through Paul's missionary journeys. These parts of the book of Acts, they echo Jesus' last commands to his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, But you will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, which is Acts chapter 1, 7, 1 to 7, and to Samaria and Judea, and that's Acts chapter 8 to 12, and to the ends of the earth. And that's the section we'll be looking at starting this morning in Acts chapter 13, verse 20. I want to look at four points this morning. Number one, the Holy Spirit has his plan and we must listen to him. Number two, God opens the door. Number three, expect Satan's opposition. And number four, the Holy Spirit will build Christ's church. Let's look at the first point. The Holy Spirit has his plan and we must listen to him. When we start looking at Acts chapter 13, we'll see that the, the focus is shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch. In Antioch, a vibrant church was growing. We learn about it in Acts chapter 11. And it says, starting in verse 19, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Spirit of God was moving. 
and he was moving in the city of Antioch. Even though the persecution was meant to destroy the church, instead, Christians left Jerusalem and they spread the message to wherever they went. And one place where the word took fruit and grew richly was in the city of Antioch. You see, the Holy Spirit is always in control. You know, the title of the book is The Acts of the Apostles, but a more accurate title would be The Acts of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who has an ultimate master plan for the church, and he's bringing it to pass. And that's what we see happening at the start of Acts chapter 13. In Antioch, there is also Barnabas and Saul. When um, the church in Jerusalem heard about the believers in Antioch, they sent up Barnabas to kind of survey the situation. And when Barnabas got there, he decided to go to look for Saul. They went to Tarsus, got Saul, and brought him back to Antioch. And they both stayed there as teachers. Now let's look at the first three verses of Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there are prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon Kadnager, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. In the church of Antioch, they had organized and there were leaders. Five of them are mentioned. Two of them were Barnabas and Saul. And while they were together, the Holy Spirit speaks. And I have a few observations about how and in what manner the Holy Spirit was able to speak to the people in this church. My first observation is this. The leaders were united. This passage says that the five leaders, maybe more people as well, they met together, and this seems to be on a regular basis. They met together to worship, to pray, and to fast. They were united in heart. You know, it's very hard to hear the Holy Spirit when there is dissension among the leadership. One thing that's been encouraging to me after coming back from study leave is that we as pastors at Brawl Trail Baptist Church, we've been meeting on a weekly basis. And during our times of meeting, it's not all been planning and reporting. Much of it has been times for us to share what God has been speaking to us and how God has been working in our lives. A second observation I have of this passage is that they fasted. In fact, it says that two times in verse 2 as well as in verse 3. Now, the um, leaders, it says, worshipped, they prayed, but as well, there's a mention of fasting. And when they placed their hands to send off Barnabas and Saul, they prayed for them and they fasted. It seems as if fasting was a regular discipline that the church in Antioch observed. Now, fasting, it isn't something that's foreign to the Bible. In fact, just about every major character in the Bible fasted. People like Moses, Elijah, David, Daniel, and Jesus, they all fasted. And Jesus himself, he assumed that his followers would fast. When Jesus was teaching in um, Ma Matthew chapter 6 about prayer, he says, and when you fast. In fact, there seems to be only certain things that we get answers to in prayer only if we choose to fast. Matthew chapter 17 verse 21 says in the King James Version, This kind does not go except by prayer and fasting. If fasting is, had such a prominent part in the Bible, the question in my mind is, why don't we fast? I see very little fasting observed in our church. Let me ask you a question. Do you fast? 
If you had to answer no to that question, my follow-up question would be, why not? Just to be totally transparent, I fast once a week. I have、um, I spend a half day fasting. What I used to do is, after dinner on、um, Wednesday nights, I won't eat again until dinner on Thursday. But I, I have to admit that、um, my experience of fasting is very shallow. I don't think I've come close to plumbing the depths. I think fasting is something that I need to learn more about. Won't you join me as we look? Into this whole spiritual discipline of fasting, and make it part of our lives. It, it it could change us. It could change our church. The first observation I had from these verses is the leaders were united. The second observation I had is they fasted, and the third observation I had was the spirit's coming was unexpected. You know, when you read this passage, you get the. Idea that you know this was not a special meeting where they're trying to discern God's will. This wasn't like a vision casting gathering. They're just meeting together to worship, to pray, what to fast, what they usually did, and then the Holy Spirit spoke. You know, I think we spend too much time in the church trying to think of a vision, then after getting a vision, trying to cast that to the congregation. Jim Simbala said, "Why should I have a vision for someone else's church? Why should we think of our own vision? God has His vision, and it's His church. Our job isn't trying to conjure up a vision. Our job is to listen and to be attentive to the Holy Spirit and to listen to His leading and follow it." To tell you the truth, I'm a little concerned about the church in general, and our church in particular, because I don't think we have done a very good job of listening to the Holy Spirit and discerning His leading. Let me give you three principles to help us to get into the mindset of being attentive to receive what the Holy Spirit has for us. The first principle is this: live a life of devotion, not just observe a devotional time. Live a life of devotion, not just observe a devotional time. You know, I think for many of us, we have specific times that we segregate for God. We have our devotional times in the morning. We have Sundays.、Um, we might have. Yearly retreats, maybe we go into a spiritual conference. We expect that God will speak to us during those times, but I think often with that kind of mindset, we miss out on when God is speaking in the in-between times. You see, the church in Antioch, it was their regular practice to worship, to pray, to fast together, and because they had this life of devotion. Then they were attentive to the Holy Spirit at all points of their lives. They were able to hear what the Holy Spirit said. In John chapter ten, Jesus uses the image of a shepherd, and he calls himself the good shepherd, and we are his sheep. This is what John chapter ten says in verses four and five. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. As sheep, we are called to come to such a close relationship with the shepherd that when he speaks, we recognize the tenor of his voice. In fact, his voice should become so familiar to us that we can identify false voices, false spirits. That tried to speak to us. You know, the more I've gone on in my my Christian life, the more I've become convinced that our spiritual destinies are not determined by the big events, life-changing、um, decisions or 
maybe going down the aisle on an invitation at a rededication conference. I think our spiritual destiny is determined by our day-by-day -day actions. When we become familiar with the rhythms of the spiritual life, when we regularly keep the spiritual disciplines, when we learn to walk with the Spirit and focus on Jesus Christ, then He'll speak to us at times we wouldn't even expect. That's my first suggestion. The first principle, live a life of devotion. The second principle is this, allow space for the Spirit. Allow space for the Spirit. You know, sometimes in church, I think we uh, program things so tightly that the Spirit couldn't even break in if He wanted to. That could happen in a worship service where we can put the schedule right down to the minute. Or that could be true in our business meetings as well. We could have a three-hour business meeting with only two minutes of prayer, one minute at its opening prayer and one minute at a closing prayer. I wonder how much more eternal work could be done if we just stopped and spent time to be still and listen for the Spirit. And we could be just overburdened by so many church activities that we're always serving or always have to attend a, a meeting that we don't even have time to get, up, get away and spend time in solitude and silence so we can hear. Mother Teresa said, We all must take the time to be silent and to contemplate, especially those who live in big cities like London and New York, where everything moves so fast. I always begin my prayer in silence, for it is in the silence of the heart that God speaks. God is the friend of silence. We need to listen to God because it's not what we say, but what He says to us and through us that matters. We need to make room in our lives and in our church for God to speak, for the Holy Spirit to work. The third principle, the first two are this, number one, Live a life of devotion. Number two, allow space for the Spirit. Number three, submit to the direction of the Spirit. After we hear the Holy Spirit speak, then we have to do exactly what He says. Go wherever He directs, without question. When the Holy Spirit spoke to the leaders as they met together to worship and to fast and to pray, you know, we're not told how, how they heard the Spirit, whether it was an audible voice whether it came through a prophet, whether it came through someone speaking in tongues and interpreted it, we don't, we don't know. The method isn't that important. But the message is. And the message was very simple. It said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. In fact, probably that direction is most notable for what it does not contain. It doesn't say what Paul and Barnabas were called to. It doesn't say where they're sent. It doesn't say how long that will be. It doesn't say where the resources will come from to supply for them. their mission. None of that. It's just very simple. But the church obeyed. Just think with me for a minute. If you remember that church and you found out that the two best leaders and teachers of the church, they were leaving, how would you think? Well, what would you think if all of the leaders of Broward Jarrell Baptist Church, all the pastors, they said that they felt God calling them to another ministry and they left? How do you feel? But you know, the people of the church of a in Antioch, they didn't complain. They didn't argue. They didn't try to um, dissuade Barnabas and Saul from leaving. Instead, they blessed them. They prayed for them. And they sent them off. You see, the people in the church of Antioch they trusted God. They trusted in God providing and leading Paul and Barnabas, and they trusted God in leading and providing for their church. But you know, when I read this story, I also think of not just the men that were called to leave. I, I think of the men who were, who were called to stay. Of the five people, two were called, three remained. I think of I was one of the ones who w remained, I'd wonder, well, why didn't God call me? 
What's so special about those guys? But you know, in this story, you you don't get even a, a hint of any competition or comparison. Paul and Barnabas were sent off with blessing because that was their role. The rest of the people stayed behind in Antioch because that was their role. Each person saw their vocation, the place where they were called, and they rejoiced in it. The key is submitting to God's will. You know, I think one major reason why we don't hear God is because we don't want to obey Him. You know, it's, it's not enough that we hear God's Word. That's wonderful if we do, but James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do it. I think a major reason why the Holy Spirit does not speak to us today as He spoke in the book of Acts in the New Testament is because today we are not willing to do what God wants us to do. In fact, I think honestly many of us, we don't want to hear God's voice. Instead, we want to have our church the way we want it. We want to be the ones in control. We want to be comfortable. After all, if God did speak to the church in North America, what do you think he'd say? Don't you think he'd have something to say about how much money we have while so many people in the world are so needy? Or when you think God would have something to say about our fear of sharing our faith with other people, when there are millions of individuals who are on the way to hell because they've never heard of the gospel? Or don't you think God would have something to say about how we have conformed to the standards of this world and we've lost any desire to live a life of holiness. When God speaks, we have to obey. And until we are willing to obey, then I don't think we're going to hear God's voice. Well, let me go on to the second point. First point, the Holy Spirit has His plan and we must listen to Him. The second point is, God opens the door. Take a look at Acts chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was intended of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. After Barnabas and Paul are sent out, the Holy Spirit guides them. But the Holy Spirit doesn't give them any specific directions. We're not told in this text the Holy Spirit told them what to do, the Holy Spirit didn't tell them the people to talk to first. But they chose to go down the coast to Seleucia and then to take a boat and cross over to Cyprus. Now why the cross over to Cyprus? Why did they choose to go to this island first? Well, if you read about Barnabas in um, Acts chapter 4, we're introduced to him right at the end of that chapter and we're told that he comes from Cyprus. So it makes sense that Barnabas would want to go back to his own hometown I'm sure that he felt comfortable there. But as well, I'm sure that he wanted his friends and relatives to hear the gospel. His desire for their salvation drove him there. And when they went there, they had a strategy. The strategy was to go first to the Jews, to meet in the synagogues, to tell them that Jesus is the Christ. And again, that makes sense because the Jews had the Old Testament. They had the prophecies of the Messiah coming. They would be prepared to receive Jesus Christ as the true Messiah. And as we read in the text, they met in the synagogues, they preached the gospel, and they traveled around the island. But we're not told that they have any fruit. Nothing much happens until, until God opens the door. And God opens the door 
through a man named Sergius Paulus, who's the proconsul from Rome. He's the highest official of the island. And it says that Sergius Paulus wanted to hear the gospel. You know, whenever God sends someone, he always prepares the way. He always makes an open door for them. And Paul and Barnabas, when they saw this open door, they stopped their own mission plans and they joined God in what he was doing. You know, we have to be attentive to how God is working around us. Henry Blackaby, he's very helpful in um, pointing out things that only God can do. When we're looking to see how God is working all around us, then we should look for these things. He points out four things that only God can do. Number one, only God can cause people to seek him. You see that in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, 11, where it says no one seeks God. No one is interested in him. So if that's true, then the Holy Spirit has to work in people so that they, they have an interest in God. So if God, someone is asking about God, then you know the Holy Spirit's working in their lives. The second thing that only God can do is only God can draw people to himself. And you see that in, in John chapter 6, 44, where Jesus tells the people that no one can come to him unless God draws them. If someone has an interest in knowing Jesus Christ, that's God working. A third thing is only God can reveal spiritual truth. John fourteen twenty six it talks about the role of the Holy Spirit. And the role of the Holy Spirit is is to lead us into spiritual truth. So if you see someone who has grasped something of the Bible, some truth in the Bible, then you know the Holy Spirit is working in them. And the fourth thing that only God can do is only God can convict in regard to sin. In John chapter 6, 16, 8, it talks again about the role of the Holy Spirit and it says the Holy Spirit convicts in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It was obvious that there is an open door for Barnabas and Paul because Sergius Paulus, the Roman proconsul, he wanted to hear the gospel. He was open to the message. The Holy Spirit was working in him. How is God working around you? The people that God has put in your close vicinity, the people that you relate to, maybe people at your workplace, maybe people who are your friends, maybe your neighbors. How is God working in them? We need to pay attention. How do we do that? First, pray. Pray for the people around you and ask that God would show you the people that he is working in. And then, secondly, take a step. And start asking them questions. Pay attention. Give them your full attention. Be present to them. Ask them probing questions. And then listen compassionately. Some questions you may ask is, what's the most significant thing happening in your life? Are there any struggles that you're going through that I can pray for you? Or even simply, do you want to talk? And then as you listen, ask God to give you the words, the exact words that he wants you to share with them. Well, we've looked at the first two points. The Holy Spirit has his plan and we must listen to him. Number two, God opens the door. And now I want to look at the third point. God opened the door, but that doesn't mean it was clear sailing. The third point is expect Satan's opposition. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 8 to 11. But Iliamas, the sorcerer, for that's what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind, and for a time, you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone 
to lead him by the hand. When Barnabas and Paul were going around Cyprus, when they came to Paphos, it wasn't just the pro council that they met. They also met a sorcerer, so a Jewish sorcerer named Elimas. And we're told that he was an advisor of the proconsul. And it was very common back then for people of high positions, officials, to have spiritual guides, priests, clairvoyants, to help them make their decisions. And Elimas had wormed his way into influence in the Sergius Paulus's life. And when he heard Paul and Barnabas and the message they shared, Elimus tried to turn the proconsul away, to st keep him from listening to the life-giving gospel. And we're told in verse 10 what's behind this opposition. Paul calls Elimus a child of the devil. You see, whenever God works, the devil will try to disrupt and to stop. You know, some people think that if they surrender everything and follow God, then everything will be smooth sailing. They won't have any problems. But nothing can be further from the truth. If we choose to follow God, if we choose to help build the kingdom of God, then there's an enemy of God who will become our opposition and will try to stop us. Yeah, all you have to do is look at Paul's life. In, in the weeks to come, we're going to see how he went from place to place and all the opposition that he faced. He faced opposition from the Jews, from the Gentiles, from religious leaders and Roman officials. Everywhere he went, he suffered. He suffered imprisonments, torture, floggings, and persecution. And you know, as Christians, we should expect that as well. We follow our leader, Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus Christ experience in his life? Well, he was unfairly arrested. He was deserted by his friends. He was tortured. And he was executed. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and we could be free. But the good news is the story doesn't stop there. Jesus didn't stay dead. But three days later, he rose again, defeating death and opening the gates of hell so that people can reach heaven. It's only after we experience the cross that we can also receive the victory. And with God, there is victory. What do we do when we do face obstacles? Well, Paul, he was directed by the Holy Spirit to announce that Elymas was going to be blind. And that's exactly what happened. He became blind. And I think his blindness, that punishment was, was chosen by God because Elymas would consider himself a seer someone who could see into the future, who could see more than the normal human being. God was showing now who had power over who could see and who couldn't see. But you know, when you think of this miracle, this was not Paul's idea. Paul didn't have the power to strike people blind. That was the Holy Spirit's power. Paul was only following what the Holy Spirit told him to do. In fact, if you read through the book of Acts, you know how many other times Paul struck someone blind? Never again. <laughs> this was the only time. In fact, if you look at how he responded to obstacles and to persecution through the book of Acts, you'll see there, there are many different responses. Sometimes he just tried to escape. He ran away like when he was lured out of a window down the wall of the city of Damascus. Sometimes he decided to, to switch his ministry location and he often shook his, his um, sandals, the dust off his feet and went to somewhere else. Sometimes he claimed protection because he was a Roman citizen. But most of the time, 
Paul allowed himself to suffer. Most of the time when opposition came, he was thrown into prison. He was flogged, stoned, threatened. But through all of these things, God built his church. And that, that brings us down to our final point. The Holy Spirit will build Christ's church. Look at the final verse. Acts chapter 13, verse 12. It says this. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. After this great miracle where Elimaz was struck blind, that caught the proconsul's attention. And then when he heard the gospel from Barnabas and Paul, he was amazed and he believed. You know, this is the pattern throughout the book of Acts. The pattern is this. There is a miracle. It attracts people, catches their attention. The gospel is preached and then the harvest is reaped. People believe. You see that in Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the people and they began speaking foreign languages. A crowd gathers. Peter preached. 3,000 people believed and were baptized. Then John and Peter were going in the temple and they saw a lame man and they healed him and a crowd gathered and Peter preached and 2,000 more were added to the church. Or Thomas, when he went to Samaria, he healed people, he cast out demons, people paid attention to him, he preached the gospel and the, the church was planted. God was working throughout the story of Acts and he's working today. And even though Satan tried to frustrate God's plan, tried to stop the spread of his kingdom, God turned Satan's attacks into good. Again, in the book of Acts, you see that over and over again. When persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, the Christians were scattered. And as they went, they started preaching the gospel. So more people heard. Paul, or I should say Saul at that point. You notice in this passage, Saul's name was changed to Paul. But Saul, back before he was a Christian, he persecuted the, the church and tried to, tried to destroy the church. But then God struck him down on the road to Damascus, blinded him again, and he converted. He became a Christian and became the most powerful spokesperson in the church. And then just last week, we learned about King Herod, who again tried to persecute the church. He imprisoned James and killed him and also imprisoned Peter. But then God struck him down dead. And we see in the results of this in Acts chapter 12, verse 24. It says, But the word of God continued to increase and spread. You know, that line. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. That could be applied anywhere in history. In fact, that could be applied today. The pandemic is here. Churches are closed. But God is working. He has a plan. And nothing can stop that plan. But God's word continued to increase and spread. And you know, we can join with him in his plan. He invites us to be part of it. What we need to do is stop, listen for the Spirit, and then submit ourselves to follow him, to do whatever he tells us to do. Why don't we do that right now? Why don't we end this time in a time of prayer? Father, thank you that you are in control, that the church isn't ours, it's yours. You know what's best, and you have a plan, and nothing can stop that plan from happening. I pray, Father, for us, help us to listen to your Spirit. I pray, Father, that after you speak to us and we hear, that you give us the grace to submit to the Spirit, to obey and to follow him wherever he leads. I pray this for your sake, for the sake of your kingdom. In Christ's name.
。阿门。